I'm a PhD candidate at USC's Media Arts and Practice Program, and I'm a longtime researcher and collaborator with the World Building Media Lab, um, as Robert said, head, headed by Alex McDowell. Um, I've performed a number of roles on the project that you're about to see. Um, in, the, in phase one, I was uh, head of design research, so I was the, the sort of liaison between the scientists and the uh, designers. Um, I've been the sound lead um, from phase one, and I'm currently still uh, the design lead while I'm working on my, I'm finishing my dissertation finally. So um, this, this started back in winter of 2016 when the World Building Media Lab made um, a connection with Michelson, the Michelson Center for Convergent Biosciences. Um, and through a series of discussions, we uh, began imagining this virtual pancreatic beta cell. And it was interesting to me because I, up until that point, had been mostly doing sort of sonification work and visualization work using um, space weather data, mostly just what I could find that was publicly available. And so I was really focused like up there. And um, this really, you know, in a, in a really compelling way, got, uh, got me thinking about in here, right? Uh, and as I started working on the cell project, I, I realized that the human cell is a universe. Uh, it's a world populated with, with like countless of these little molecular machines that work together to build bigger molecular machines, that work together to build bigger molecular machines, um, until you get uh, somehow systems that can produce insulin and like walk around in the real world. Um, live and breathe and, and um, interact with their environments, which to me was you know, absolutely fascinating. Um, and so for me, this, this is just as inspiring as like stellar nurseries and, and all the stuff that I, I had been really thinking about up until that point. In the, case, in the case of the beta cell, it's this um, tiny universe contained within a membrane that's about the size roughly of 10 microns, which if you know anything about uh, microns, is very small. <laughs> um, so specialists in structural biology and pro proteomics, which is the, um, the main field uh, of researchers we're working with, they've been you know, kind of collecting this data year after year, after year just you know, plugging away. But most of this data ends up siloed. Um, it, it's publicly available, but because it's being developed um, out of these very specific disciplines, Sometimes even the scientists themselves um, aren't communicating to each other. Like they're 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 forming these very um, kind of you know uh, fettered views of their of their own field. And so the question for Dr. Ray Stevens, who um, is you could think of as our executive producer, um, the question for him was like, how do we create an immersive experience that really pulls all of this data and all of this all of this knowledge back together just to kind of reconstruct this universe? Um, in a way that we could actually go inside, right? Rather, rather than it being a, a simulation, um, how could we go inside and kind of intuit um, what we're seeing in there? So I apologize for all the text. This deck was orig originally um, made for like, pitch purposes. Um, so if you're investors, come talk to me. Um, so, so why do this? I mean, the, the main reason is that 642 million people are expected to be living with uh, diabetes by the year 2040. Um, that, that's type one and type two diabetes. And so the eventual goal um, for the Bridge Institute, but also for, for us in the World Building Lab, was to think about how to use storytelling and, and design methodology and world building in particular um, to, to help them identify drug targets and to help them eventually come up with a cure. So, um, so for phase one, which I, I was uh, uh, heavily involved with as a, a, as a design researcher, um, we began to tackle this multifaceted problem, um, part of which was the knowledge problem that I was just talking about. But it was also a language problem, right? There's all this esoteric language. Um, structural biologists and, and proteomics researchers use very, uh, you know, they talk about uh, glucogen-like peptides, uh, you know, uh, C terminal helix of GLP one, and you know, it, it, most people, most lay people, have no idea what they're hearing when, when they hear all that stuff. And even a lot of the researchers themselves, who are familiar with the language, don't fully comprehend like the complexity that's happening within within the cell. Um, but the other problem, the main problem, really, is a visualization problem. So um, on the left here, this was only a small slice of the diagram we were handed in the very beginning and told to make sense of, 
<laughs> they, they, they handed us this giant printout of this diagram and said, um, help us decode this. And we, yeah, and so they're, they're thinking about it and in turn, we began to think about it in terms of a city. So a city system, how can you sort of begin to imagine this as being like a, a city and to leverage those insights um, so that we can just disentangle the complexities uh, and, and build a compelling experience out of it. Luckily, in the World Building Media Lab, we are we are kind of like we thrive on complexities. We we are all about kind of uh, creating complexity. So this um, this design methodology uh, is a sort of variant on systems oriented methodologies that you might have um, read about in biology. Researchers like Susan Oyama or in uh, systems thinking, uh, Donella Meadows. So, um, but this particular kind of systems thinking uh, was, was born out of the mind of um, Hollywood produ production designer Alex McDowell, um, who um, sort of began to think about world building or systems thinking as world building with his work on Minority Report. So he was the, uh, the production designer for that film. And he was given the job on the same day as the script writer. And so the question was, how do we do our work without a script to work to? And so they flipped the model kind of inside out and began to think about building the world first, actually like pull, pull together research from all the various fields and domains of knowledge that make a world, things like environment, uh, you know, architecture, advertising, you know, time and space issues, mobility, you know, how do people get around, what technology are people holding in their pockets? Are wearing on their bodies in some way? What's the weather like? What's the climate like? All sorts of different um, aspects that make up a world. You begin to do deep dives of research into, into these domains, pull in experts, um, gather that knowledge, and begin to do informed speculation, like very grounded and informed speculation about the world, what the world is going to be like in, in 20 years or 50 years or, or, or um, whatever that is. But Minority Report really showed Alex, in particular, that this that this process could actually be applicable to real world problems because Minority Report, according to Alex, has spun out I think a hundred real world patents on different technologies that that appear in the film. Um, most famously, the gestural interface, which was developed by John Undercoffler for that film, uh, and John now owns a company here in LA called Oblong, and they develop that gestural interface system uh, for real for Fortune 500 companies. So for the cell project, we, we started to simplify the diagram by imagining the cell as like a city, a neighbor, you know, a series of neighborhoods, all of the pathways as being stops along a tube map. And taking the London Underground map as inspiration, we started to think about the various pathways in this way. Um, but that's the top level view. So you, you also need to have a sort of first person perspective, like what is actually happening in these pathways. Um, and so part of my job was to take all of the like all of this knowledge from the scientists who are guiding the process, and then develop visual tools to hand off to our um, designers uh, to help them think through what's actually happening um, in in the cell between all of these protein structures. Um, and then our artists go to work and they start making uh, concept art, and the concept art looks nothing like what's in your cell, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, th this, this initial phase was really about, about trying to do something different, like actually different from, from what scientists were used to. Um, and it had this architectural influence, partially because we had other sort of briefs to me uh, regarding like, the city and you know, architecture and what, what insights about the cell could actually be mapped onto the way we, we build cities and think about um, artificial structures. Uh, and this was the final result, so I'm hoping this without me having to, yeah, here we go. So the question is, am I going to have, there we go, yep. I'm just going to skip forward a little bit. So this is actual, this is real-time footage uh, from someone going through the, uh, the, the experience. Okay, so that was great. 
Yeah, it was fun. It was successful. Lots of scientists really appreciated the, uh, the fact that they could go in there and they could identify the, the various processes. Um, but we realized that, um, that the city metaphor was leading us down a particular direction that maybe was getting us away from some of the more compelling insights in the, the, the abstractions, right? The, the, the things that we know to be true about the cell um, that, that sort of buck against intuition in various ways. And so um, we decided to sort of get back to the data, the actual data, publicly available data. Um, and we, we luckily had a, a scientist named Helen Berman, uh, Dr. Helen Berman, who was the, one of the co-founders of the PDB, the Protein Data Bank. And so she was able to guide the next phase in which we um, sort of tackled this, this well-known problem in structural biology, which is um, that the representations they use to, to communicate the structures of the, the proteins really haven't changed much in about 20 years. They're the same kind of ribbon diagrams and whatnot that, um, that they've been using for a very long time. And we also began to think about different audiences because the initial phase was all about uh, building a tool that scientists could use. And the question was, like, can we actually take this to the lay public in a way that is as compelling for a teenager as it would be for a scientist, as it would be for uh, a 10 year old? And I think importantly, we, we started to ask this question, you know, sort of uh, perennial world building question, which is uh, how can a system be a narrative? How can you construct a system that, that has narrative potential? Uh, and so the first step toward that was um, finding a Rosetta Stone between the artist and the scientist, a way to talk about the, the, the activities within the cell, the interrelations of the proteins in a way that made sense to both sides. And we found that with origami. Origami became the kind of the key that kind of unlocked everything. Uh, scientists liked it because um, protein folding, this is the way we, they think about proteins building into larger structures like organelles and membranes, all sorts of things that they, you know, proteins fold. And so it made sense to use origami as a metaphor. It was, it was uh, great for artists for obvious reasons. Uh, it's intuitive, it, it's functional in some way, it's aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and, and, and so I, for me though, I think most importantly, what it gave us was a base unit. And that base unit was the tetrahedron. Uh, the tetrahedron is important because uh, it, it was a nice sort of, um, sort of analog for the geometry of uh, carbon chains when they bond with single atom. So they, they form this tetrahedral, tetrahedral shape, and the scientists were really excited about that. They loved that. Um, but I think also more importantly, the, the, the tetrahedron gave us this unit to build from and as sort of a starting point. So we could build out from that and build larger structures that could be used to build larger structures and on and on, just, just like the cell works. So, um, so you have this modular system. So here's a ribbon diagram. I don't know why they, they insist on using esoteric, but they have this uh, ribbon model on the left and uh, one of our models here on the right, which is uh, recognizable to anyone in structural biology, but still um, sort of creates this uh, sort of narrative um, uh, gloss on, on the, the, the system. And so, Using that modular system, they began to think about how linking and folding logic um, could be imagined in the world space to build these larger structures out of smaller structures. And, um, and they started to investigate the interactions more directly. So, so to think about how these things actually bind to one another, what, what sorts of events happen after that. Um, and in this process, the designers had to ask a number of questions, of course, because we're not experts in, in proteomics. And so we had scientists in the room, we were asking very naive questions. And out of that process, we actually made discoveries. Um, the main one that we, we discovered was there, there was this question about whether or not the Krebs cycle um, began by being phosphorylized by a particular uh, protein structure and uh, known as PKA. And um, the, the, one of the larger databases in the world, which is in, in Japan, uh, they, they had this cycle described in such a way as being phosphorylized by this particular protein. And we kept asking this question, but this doesn't look right. Why, why, why do they have this listed um, as being phosphorylized this way? And we just kept asking the question and then discovered they had a mistake in their database. Um, so we corrected their literature. 
<laughs> which is a, yeah, really great. Um, and then moving into the, the actual, um, the experience, like building out the experience and thinking about um, how people going into the, the VR um, would, would be able to orient in the space and recognize objects, we realized that you know, there's this, this real problem, right? This is a, a, a well-known problem. Uh, Bas van Frossen wrote about the scientific image and the manifest image. We all, we all are familiar with the manifest image. We walk around every day, we have our tables and chairs, and the world as it unfolds to us is the manifest image. And as artists, we're really good at, at creating experiences that um, sort of square with our everyday experiences. But the scientific image gives us a view on a, a world that is just as dynamic and, 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 and structural and geometric, and, uh, but is completely alien. Um, it's almost done. Um, and so we, we came up with this system that we based on World War II aircraft recognition posters uh, to, to prime people before they go into um, the cell so they could sort of get used to who the constituents are. And then this was the uh, product. And if you went into the VR outside, this is what... Welcome to the world in a cell. Sorry. Presented by the University of Not a big fan California's of the Bridge Institute and USC World Building Media Lab. Below you. I'll back that up a little bit so you can get a sense of. Blue Coast will provide the power source for insulin production, but the cell also needs an activation mechanism. GLP-1 is a peptide hormone that acts as a signal to beta cells. But okay, so we're running short of, on time, so um, I'll just skip that and uh, let you meet the team. So this is Alex McDowell, uh, who you, who's easily Googleable. Um, Helen Berman, our, our science advisor and, and co-PI. Uh, Todd Richmond, whose voice you just heard in the voiceover, uh, and who um, is one of the directors at ICT. And Ray Stevens, our executive producer. And then that's the team. So uh, these are our scientists, most, two, two of our scientists on top, and then the rest are mostly the artists who, who, who uh, were pivotal for making this happen. So thanks a lot. Thank you.